Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning for Coffee with Colleen, the EDC Coffee Chat. We are very thankful and honored to have Commissioner Mark Ozias on with us this morning. And he is going to be covering the American Rescue Plan and funding that is going to be coming to the county. Uh, that And basically the process which he intends, the commission in total, county commission intends to follow in order to determine how to distribute and deploy this funding. Uh, so just a few quick um, keeping items. If you have any uh, questions, we would love to be able to have you ask those, but if you will- Downstairs, listening to that. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's see, I'm gonna make sure everybody's on mute there. Um, if we will, uh, I'll ask you to put your name in the chat or raise your hand. And then when there's a break, we'll call on you and we'd like you to ask your question. And um, and then we will move on from there. So um, Commissioner Ozias is gonna talk for a bit and then after a while, we'll have an opportunity for questions. So uh, Mark, if you'd like to take it away, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, you bet, Colleen. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think the screen share is up. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, in that case, uh, an official good morning. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to see you all today. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about how we are hoping to deploy the funds that are that have been made available to the county and more broadly to our community through uh, ARPA. Uh, the American Relief Act. So uh, just the basics to start with, uh, the county is um, will run in allocated funds. Uh, the first seven and a half million uh, has just come in and we expect the second seven and a half million to come in approximately one year from now. Uh, each of the cities, uh, Port Angeles, Squim, and Forks also received allocations, uh, as did all of our local tribes. So in total for our community, we're expecting an influx of over $25 million uh, in relief funds uh, to flow here over the next couple of years. And that's just in, in the direct funding allocations. There are uh, a number of, of other uh, funds that are flowing through a wide variety of channels. And that's you know, part of our process is to really understand uh, uh, what, what all those channels are. So uh, in essence, uh, we have until 2024 to obligate all of these dollars and actually through 2026 to spend them. So unlike the CARES dollars, which we had a very tight timeline uh, and, and a quick turnaround to get those dollars deployed, uh, this time we have a little bit more opportunity for um, planning. And so I'm really happy about that. At the same time, uh, of course, we want to turn around and get these dollars as many as possible out into the community as quickly as we can. So uh, this time around, we're really going to try and balance uh, speed with, with planning. And uh, we'll see how that works. So uh, you know, when when we look at how uh, our county did uh, in comparison to other counties with our CARES Act dollars, uh, we did really well, actually, I think, in terms of getting ourselves organized and in terms of deploying that resource over 60 percent of the CARES dollars that came to Clallam County, we were able to turn around and uh, put right back out there into the community. Certainly, uh, a lot of that was with the help of uh, Colleen and the EDC, uh, certainly uh, with, with much of the business and nonprofit uh, organization support. Of course, we had a lot of other help as well, but our goal this time is going to be very similar. Uh, you know, We wanna get as many of these dollars out into the community as possible. So, uh, the structure that we're trying to put together here is uh, has a couple of different couple of different pieces. Uh, first of all, we are um, working right now with all of our department heads and elected officials to identify 
what sort of internal costs uh, we might have that are appropriate uses for uh, for these relief funds. So those would include things like lost revenue, uh, for example. You know, the fair has been canceled for the last two years. You know that that that. Uh, that equates to lost revenue for the county. And there are a couple of other categories of lost revenue, although I don't expect that to be uh, too major. Uh, certainly there have been a number of technological uh, upgrades that have been necessary in order to support uh, our, our open and public government uh, during COVID times. And, and uh, so those types of expenses would be another example of internal expenses. The most significant internal expenses I expect us to uh, to be using some of these dollars for are in the public health arena. And uh, while we don't have a sense, you know, quite yet of what that looks like, uh, we've heard Dr. Barry speak uh, of sort of moving from a pandemic, uh, you know, a pandemic mindset to an endemic mindset uh, with COVID. So basically, what that means is uh, we expect it's going to be with us for quite a while and something that's going to continue to need uh, intense and ongoing focus from our public health department. So uh, I would anticipate a suite of uh, public health needs over the next few years, um, you know, ranging from uh, obtaining enough PPE to supporting a contact tracing team, uh, et cetera. So um, we're, 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 we just started working to identify all of those internal costs. Once we have a sense, uh, once we have a sense of that, then we'll know what is left over uh, to be able to deploy out into the community. Uh, I'd want to take a quick break. I see uh, that the county's chief financial officer, Mark Lane, has uh, joined the call or perhaps has been on and I just saw his face pop up. Uh, so Mark, thank you for being here this morning and uh, don't be surprised if I if I lean on you, uh, you know, here during the rest of the presentation. Um, so, uh, moving from internal costs, then, uh, you know, next is what are the needs out in the community and, and you know, how can we best deploy these funds? And so uh, one of the things that, that we're working on right here up front, and uh, Colleen has, has really done a lot of work to help us, to help us organize this, and the screen share that I've put up uh, is just one of, of several dozen slides uh, that she presented to the commissioners a few days ago to, to help us and help the community understand all the different channels through which funds are flowing and you know, where there's a lot of resource and where there's a little. Uh, but really, that's our first order of business. You know, there are, uh, in addition to these direct allocations, there are funding streams flowing through federal agencies, flowing through state agencies, uh, flowing through uh, economic development entities and others to uh, you know to to affect different areas out in the community. For example, uh, in the behavioral health arena, you know, we know that there is a lot of resource that's going to be flowing to providers, uh, and that's going to be coming in a variety of different ways. Uh, we know also that behavioral health is one of our most significant community needs. It was before uh, COVID, it is even more so after COVID. So, you know, we'll be looking at what are the gaps uh, in that system. You know, child care is another example. There are probably, a, you know, at least a half a dozen different ways that uh, this Relief Act is supporting child care, but Right now, it's hard to say how all those pieces are going to come together and actually impact, uh, you know, impact that right here on the ground in Clallam County. So, uh, what we've the, the the basic structure that we've that we're trying to to think about with regard to any category of relief is we know there's an immediate need, we know that there's a long term need, and we know that it's going to take a little bit of time with some of these categories to understand. Uh, you know how all the different channels are flowing. So we're as a first step, we are working uh, to identify within a variety of categories what is our short-term need, like maybe through the end of the year, and uh, then uh, more broadly, what is our need for the next several years? You know, like probably through 2026 uh, at the very least. And uh, so we think that that structure will allow us to get some of this funding deployed right away as the rest of it takes a little bit more shape uh, and we all develop a better understanding of where resources are going and where they're not, uh, then we'll be able to uh, able to more effectively address those gaps. 
So the, the, the basic areas that we're looking at uh, out in the community to, to deploy these resources uh, include childcare, uh, mental and behavioral health, hunger relief, local business support, housing, broadband infrastructure, uh, and and I think those are, are the primary categories. So we're putting, as much as we did with the CARES Act uh, effort, uh, we're, we're working with a lot of partners and uh, putting together working groups that will, within each of these areas, that will help us define those short and long-term needs. So uh, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, in the childcare arena, uh, Lynn Keenan, uh, who I just saw pop onto the uh, onto my video screen a moment ago, uh, has been working really hard. Hi, Lynn. Uh, working really hard with the team that came together uh, right after COVID hit and started talking about how we were going to support child care with CARES Act dollars. You know, that group has stayed in touch, uh, and and uh, and Lynn is is leading the effort to help us understand what the what the short term and long term needs are there uh, in the mental and behavioral health arena. Uh, I've reached out to the chair of the county's behavioral health advisory committee. Uh, her name is Stephanie Lewis, and she is actually the administrator of our regional behavioral health organization uh, called the Salish. Uh, ASO. And uh, anyhow, she has offered to help put together a small group of, of um, sort of key players in the behavioral health arena <clears throat> who are, um, who are, uh, you know, agency heads who have a sense for what funding will be flowing uh, to and through their agencies over the next couple of years so uh, that we can then identify gaps and be strategic. Uh, in the hunger relief area, <clears throat> uh, we're going to be partnering with the Peninsula Food Coalition, which is an existing group that works on uh, hunger relief issues all the time. Uh, it's comprised of the heads of all of our local food banks, uh, food programs, uh, has a lot of input from the WSU Extension uh, and others. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to their guidance in that arena. Uh, in the, the business support arena, we're certainly going to continue to lean on uh, Colleen and the EDC team to help us understand you know, where the gaps are and what, uh, and I imagine that it's likely uh, that we're going to uh, probably do uh, 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 at least one, if not several rounds of grant funding, although we haven't really you know, discussed the parameters for that yet, but I don't think it's, I'm going too far out on a limb uh, to think that we might use a similar model uh, as we did with the, uh, with the lifeboat grants, although I think uh, you know, we would probably think of those a little bit differently, but uh, but we do expect to deploy a resource out to our business community, which has been impacted, uh, and hopefully with a focus on businesses that haven't had access for whatever reason. You know, whether that's because the relief didn't flow their direction or because uh, you know there there was a holdup at the bank uh, or or whatnot. Um, but we're, we'll be looking to fill gaps there. Uh, in the housing arena, uh, Commissioner Johnson, uh, who may be on the call this morning, I, if you are, I, I don't, I don't see you yet. But if you are, hello, Randy. Uh, Commissioner Johnson is offered to partner with Christy Smith uh, at the United Way, who has been doing a lot of work to try and organize our community already around uh, housing issues. Uh, so that working group, I, I expect, like others, will will come forward with some recommendations, both for the next year and then uh, over the next couple of years. And then in the broadband arena, the county and the port have been working uh, closely together here over the last several months in particular uh, the, with, with organizational support from Karen Affeld at the North Olympic Development Council. Uh, in essence, there are you know, a lot of uh, rural broadband funds flowing and our job is to get ourselves organized as quickly as possible uh, so that we can describe what those opportunities are. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we have a team working on that uh, and I'm and, uh, also grateful that we might have the opportunity to actually have sufficient resource to support that effort. So 
Uh, again, you know, we're the, the general construct that we're going for is asking these working groups to help us understand what the need looks like between now and the end of the year, and then more broadly what the need looks like over the next few years with an emphasis on uh, both on filling gaps, but also looking for opportunities to, uh, you know, to, to get more than just relief. Uh, and I think that's really, you know, what I'm most looking forward to this time around as we have a little bit more opportunity to plan is you know, where can we make gains that are, uh, that are beyond you know, beyond just COVID relief. And, and uh, you know, there needs to be a, a, a general nexus to COVID for, for much of this. Uh, however, we do have a little bit more broad flexibility uh, in some arenas than we did with the CARE Act. And so if there are opportunities uh, for some significant gains here for our community, we're gonna be, we're gonna be looking for that in addition to just uh, filling gaps. So with that, uh, I think I'm going to stop for a minute. And um, Mark Lane, is there anything that I mischaracterized uh, or or missed uh, from your perspective or from our our initial conversation yesterday? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I apologize. I have a, a couple minutes late. I was having a little bit of a technical snafu. I'm I'm working uh, from home this morning, but uh, no, I think you 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 covered it uh, pretty uh, uh, pretty well. Um, you know, one one of the things, and I'm, I'm sure I, I may may have just missed it, but uh, you know, one of the other things that we're assessing is is is, is county internal um, needs, and um, one of those. Um, uh, you know, areas uh, beyond just the broadband infrastructure that there potentially may uh, need to be some uh, uh, some attention put to is looking at our water and sewer infrastructures uh, within the county. That's a, another area that I'm expecting there to be um, some uh, some some indicated needs. Um, you know, one of the things, and uh, just so you know, step back for a second, understand how. Uh, the American Rescue Plan Act funds that are coming through can be um, utilized. Um, you know, we we certainly have certain categories um, that are pretty uh, closely tied um, to uh, COVID-19 and our mitigation efforts and response to that, um, uh, as well as its negative economic impacts, which you know provide us a, a, a fairly broad um, ability to address. Uh, uh, certain industries and businesses and organizations that were particularly impacted or, or you know, uh, was already an existing situation but was exacerbated uh, by COVID-19. Um, certainly those, those um, uh, represent eligible uh, costs, but, uh, uh, you know, a couple, one category that we believe is going to give us a lot of flexibility um, is within the lost revenue um, component. Now, we have not, as a county, um, uh, quite nailed down how much that is. Um, but essentially what that will do is for every dollar um, that we, uh, uh, according to the U.S. Treasury uh, calculation guidelines, um, uh, uh, indicate that we lost in revenue in comparison to our base year of comparison, which was 2019 pre-pandemic, um, we will actually be able to utilize those funds for pretty much any um, uh, cost relating to provision of government services. So as you can imagine, when you look at the, the breadth of what uh, the county does um, in servicing the, the needs of its citizens, that's a very broad category. And so that will, um, even if we have uh, certain costs that don't necessarily fit um, uh, directly in the COVID affected um, air, you know, arena, um, that, that category we believe is going to give us uh, um, a tremendous amount of additional flexibility to um, put those those dollars at work, um, whether it's in, in support of external community needs um, that may be outside of COVID um, and or um, related to uh, um, uh, enhancing uh, the level of uh, government services that the county is providing. So, but uh, that's all I had, Mark. Great. Thank you. Uh, and I guess just to, to uh, you know, conclude before we move on to questions is that our goal is to work closely with our city partners and tribal partners. Uh, you know, while, uh, you know, we may not Sorry, always be able to sleep. 
while we may not always uh, you know, have exactly the same priorities, uh, at the very least, it's really important to me to make sure that every body who is responsible for allocating some of these funds at the very least knows what each other are doing, uh, if not actually you know, really coordinating on efforts. So uh, I also want to make sure and say thank you to all of our our, uh, our, our colleagues uh, in Forks and Port Angeles and SQUIM who uh, have been such active participants uh, throughout the COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic and certainly uh, here in this effort to get organized around relief dollars. I uh, wanted to let you all know that, that uh, I have also been working to keep our nonprofit community and, and right now most particularly uh, our, our traditional nonprofit funders uh, engaged so that they know what, what we're doing, they understand what the priorities are, so that they can be strategic with their funds. You know, there's a handful of private foundations, uh, the First Federal Community Foundation, uh, uh, the Phillips, uh, you know, Phillips Fund, uh, and several others, United Way, who are regular significant funders of the nonprofit community here in Clallam County. You know, they have been working very hard to be responsive in their own realms uh, to, to the needs in the community that have been created by COVID. And uh, so just as it's important to partner with our city and tribal governments in order to be strategic, uh, we are also working very hard to make sure that those nonprofit funders uh, are informed and engaged in the conversation right from the beginning, because you know certainly it takes uh, all of us working together if we're actually going to achieve the gains that we're hoping to see here. So um, with that, I, um, I dropped a link in the chat box to a pretty good overview of how these funds can be used for those who are interested. Um, the MRSC is uh, a really good resource for local government folks. Uh, and so for those of you who aren't familiar, um, you know, this, it's, a, it's a great resource generally, but I did put a link to a nice overview of guidance for how these dollars can be used. So for those who are interested in learning a little bit more detail, that would be a good first step. So with that, I'd love to see what questions, uh, concerns, or whatnot uh, all you have. So it, I don't see questions right now. So, uh, but I would like to just share, since we have a bit of time here, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and uh, with a few other of the slides that I presented at, um, at the meeting with the commissioners and just talk a little bit about some of these buckets. Specifically, I wanted to spend some time talking about businesses because this is an economic forum and uh, talk about what kind of has happened with business uh, relief in Clallam County. Um, so I'm gonna, but there's a few others. I want, just wanted to share that this is a, uh, a table showing what the different school districts in our county have received. So I'm gonna go to slideshow that it showed, so it shows up a little bit better for everyone. Um, and um, so there's in the, uh, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund uh, that was delivered from the state to local school districts, there was about 35 million that in total, uh, ESSR one and two have been distributed last year and then February of this year. And then uh, there will be more funding coming out shown in the fourth column there, ARP ESSR in July. And so that's intended to help narrow that gap of, um, of lost education that's occurred during the last uh, 15 months based since so many people, kids had to learn over Zoom and that's not necessarily a good format for a lot of people. Um, I'm sure school board members could tell us a lot more about that. But, and then also there's education that, or funding coming to Peninsula College uh, that 
is about seven and a half million dollars. So, but a huge portion of that has to go to directly to students. So the message here is that if you know of anybody that's considering getting an education right now, they should really be looking at this because the, the school district has not just additional funding for grants, for uh, scholarships, but also for any wraparound services such as transportation or um, the fees associated with attending Peninsula College or even childcare. So that is available at Peninsula College. Um, and then there's uh, E-rate grants. So we wanna make sure our libraries and our school districts are applying for the different E-rate grants. That's coming from uh, the uh, FCC and 7.2 billion nationally, uh, and also private schools. So Five Acres, Queen of Angels, et cetera, we wanna make sure they all know about that as an opportunity for um, some grant funding and, and applying for it uh, before it runs out. Um, and this is a just a recap of what the cities and the county will be receiving over a two year period. So as Commissioner Ozias said, half of the funding will be distributed, or I believe has been distributed. I know that Mark said the counties received theirs. I'm not sure if the cities have received their first round yet, but so the, the elected officials will be deciding how to distribute those funds. And the great news is that the amounts going to cities is quite a bit more than everyone was initially told. Um, it had been that the, um, as an example, the city of Squim was expecting 1.6 million and now it's 2.1 plus. Uh, so great news and they'll be able to, you know, deploy that those funds in, as I understand the the requirements um, are very similar or exactly the same as the counties. Mark and uh, Mark, do you guys know about that? The rules for the cities um, relative to what the deployment rules are for the county for these funds. Are you are you talking, Colleen, about the uh, uh, allowed for uses? Of, yes. of the funds by the city. Yeah, they essentially mirror um, what we've uh, talked about um, at, at the county level. Uh, the cities and, and counties are all, all roll up under the, the same state and local government uh, coronavirus relief funds uh, rules um, okay. that are governed by the treasury. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, and then a lot of, not a lot, it, it's all relative, but um, mental health and social support. And if anybody wants a copy of these um, slides, we can sure get them to you. But then also quite a bit of funding through housing and utility assistance. Um, a lot of that is go will be directly from uh, the state where individuals apply. So we'll be having that information as it rolls out on choose column first so that individuals can, uh, use that as a resource if they're a homeowner. Uh, and additionally, there's funding that will come through to say Serenity House and OLICAP for rental assistance and, um, and then LIHEAP as an example. So for people that are behind in their, uh, their energy payment bills to PUD, that will be a resource through OLICAP. And, um, uh, let's see. So that covers um, different options there. Then hunger relief options. Uh, a lot of this is direct formulas that will go directly to individuals um, if they're connected to SNAP or to WIC, etc. cetera. Um, school meals now that uh, people, kids that are on free and reduced lunch, they can get funding through the summertime. Uh, and then the biggest bulk of the funding coming out from the federal government is to individuals. So um, the $1,400 individual stimulus payments, those have already been distributed by and large, uh, unemployment insurance, and um, then the child tax credit and earned income tax credit expansion 
on people's uh, tax return. And um, uh, let's see. So also for all the nonprofits in Clallam County, there's a lot more funding for AmeriCorps volunteers. And also OLICAP runs a senior program and uh, they, but I've, I've been told by uh, Cherish, who's the executive director of, and, and her team that the majority of those AmeriCorps senior volunteers are in Jefferson County. So if you know of people that would like to have a stipend and support the needs of Clallam County, this is a great way to do that. Um, and that would, and then as an example, OLICAP has the group of uh, volunteers that receive this stipend that is now being beefed up by a billion dollars nationally. And so they can support things uh, around economic development. So it's a coordination with the, um, with the AmeriCorps Senior Program Administrator in Jefferson County to get some of those volunteer services. Uh, transportation, I know I saw Kevin on. Kevin, do you want to speak to this at all? Yeah, Colleen, sorry, I had to step out for a minute. If you could. Yeah, go right ahead. What was your question there? Oh, I have on the slide you had shared with me last week. Um, sorry to put you on the spot like that, uh, but that the allocation from CARES Act and SIRSA was about 11.9 million or so for the first two rounds, but you said that uh, WASDOT had not yet informed the different transit authorities across the state what the amount of funding would be uh, to, for Clallam Transit. Is that still the case or have they announced uh, the funding amounts? Yeah, the only thing for sure at this point is we did receive our awards for the, uh, the CARES and the, the CRISA funds. And at uh, one of my, uh, my transit meetings, we had um, the American Recovery Act funds. They don't know the total amount and how that's gonna uh, be distributed to the transit. So at this point, but uh, uh, probably within the next few weeks, they believe they'll have those awards, so. Okay, and then I saw a couple people from the port on. Um, does anyone wanna speak to the uh, airport relief and how that has been um, distributed at this point. I, uh, oh, Dan's on uh, as well. I can uh, speak to that and then Dan can chime in. The money that we receive for the airport has to be used for airport services. And in generally, it costs the port more to run the airport than the revenues we received. And that's very typical of general aviation uh, airports that there's not enough activity to generally support having a community airport. But it's a really important asset. So the CARES funding that we have received for the airport will go toward our, um, help us cover our loss that we have each year. And Dan, if you'd like to add anything. Sure, Karen, uh, that was very eloquent and pretty much complete. Uh, basically, we received two grants uh, from CARES. One was in the amount of $69,000 um, earlier on. And the second one that came in was for um, $23,000. That one is a little bit more specific with uh, regards to being used for um, uh, sanitation and um, um, cleaning up of any potential germs and things of that nature related to uh, contamination for, uh, for COVID. So we appreciate the funds, absolutely. Yeah, and I'd like to add that uh, with Dash Air Shuttle coming to the community, we will have more landings. And so once we get over the threshold of, is it 10,000 and uh, takeoffs and landings per year? Is that right, Dan? Actually, they base the increase of the funding based on the number of passengers. Oh, so that's right. We'll be looking for a target of uh, 10,000 uh, employments per year. That'll increase our uh, FAA funding from $150,000 per year up to a million dollars per year. So that's a that's a big, big, important thing for us. Yeah. So, so be ready to buy those uh, airplane tickets. And, so right there, that's a big reason why the port 
other than serving the community, which of course is all, always our primary uh, concern, we want to make sure we have the over 10,000 employments. So, you know, the funding that comes in to us, it's, it's a cliff that if you go below it, it drops $850,000 per year from federal funding. And if you can climb up over that and stay over it, it's a million dollars. So um, we are very uh, hopeful that that will be a success and we won't be in the red. Is that right? That's right. And to put that into perspective, also uh, back at the peak of air travel out here at the airport, we had 54,000 employments per year. So uh, 10,000, I think, is well within reach. Uh, I think that's uh, that's going to be happening. And on that same note, kind of excited, a week from today, uh, the first two airplanes are due to be delivered out here to the airport. So they won't have the new paint job on yet, but they'll be they'll, at least a couple of them will be here. So that'll be a, a nice visual thing to see. And I think it's important to keep in mind for a community airport that when um, you have a choice to fly or drive, if you want to maintain a viable community airport since it's very expensive and for a commercial air service to be financially viable, uh, it's really important for the community to make the choice to, to fly and use that air service so that we can keep it. Great. And I see Jeff James is on. I could put him on the spot too. He's our new executive director at the Port of Port Angeles. If he wants to just turn his camera on and say hello to everybody briefly. There we go. There he is. <laughs> uh, hello. Right. Um, so uh, in case I didn't uh, have the opportunity uh, uh, to meet the, the bulk of the group uh, the last Last time I was on, I'm like, I believe that was a couple of weeks ago. But uh, yeah, I started the, uh, the executive uh, director role on uh, this Monday, um, actively getting up to speed and uh, look forward to, uh, you know, uh, contributing uh, to the community and to the uh, support operations overall. Right. Thanks so much, Jeff. So I will go ahead and go back to um, the the slides here. So I, I won't go over that. There's all sorts of different funding categories. What I, what I did want to get to is the, the slide around funding that has come through to businesses in our county. And uh, the update from this, we've been surveying restaurants that uh, have received any restaurant revitalization funding. We've been working with 80 businesses 80 restaurants across the county to ensure that they have uh, connections and advisors from SBDC and CIE as an example, and, and uh, or their own accounting uh, accountants that they work with or CPAs to apply for restaurant revitalization funding. And so far we know of five restaurants that have been informed that they will be receiving some pretty significant funding, but the, the pot of funding nationally is 28.6 billion, but the SBA has said they've received over $75 billion worth of asks. And that has been stopped uh, because there was a lawsuit filed about um, and uh, around uh, the, the uh, I don't know how to describe this correctly, but the fairness of it going to minorities and women. And so until that's dealt with in the courts, there won't be more funding going out as I understand it. Um, that's what I've read about. Uh, so, and there's been uh, 731 idle loans that have been distributed in Clallam County in 2020 for a total of $34.9 million. Now that is a loan um, that has to be paid back, but they're really uh, lucrative terms that uh, I believe if I recall correctly, 3.75% interest for a uh, for-profit company and 2.75% interest for a nonprofit. Um, and there's also been 1.369 million uh, distributed in, in idle advances. And then that was right at the beginning where you received $1,000 uh, 
per every employee that you had up to 10,000, um, but they ran out of money. And then the program after um, that was created following that was that there would be, um, there would be the ability for businesses to apply for funding if they were in a designated census block but um, as a couple people probably on this call can tell you, it was a really arduous process to prove that you were eligible to receive the funding. Uh, even if you knew you had applied, you were in the right location um, and you could show the drop in revenues. Uh, thank goodness for Janie Sacco at SBA, she really, uh, carried some people through this process and didn't give up. Um, but so people could get up to a total of 10,000 based on what they had received before um, and up to 10. But we, I know probably our partners here on the call, CIE and SBDC, uh, we spent lots of hours trying to get folks getting uh, those funds. And then rural provider relief, there, there were 103 awards countywide and uh, that was between round one and round two, there was uh, 25.5 million that was dis distributed to dentists and any provider that took Medicare. And, uh, and I have this wrong here, round three is opening soon and it's not 8.5 million nationally, it's 8.5 billion nationally. So there's gonna be more funding that will come through and those providers can again apply for the funding. So we're gonna be making sure our, our providers know, and I'm sure OMC will be working with them as well to make sure everybody knows about that. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program uh, was 114, almost 115 million was funded in our county. Uh, in 2020, there were 1,440 that received 85 million and then that supported 11,441 employees. And in 2021, there were, before it closed, there were 519. So, and there were 30 mil, there was 30 million distributed to Clallam County businesses that supported 3,703 employees. The average amount went down dramatically because in the second round, you had to show that you had a 25% reduction in revenues. So for some businesses, it was a bit of a windfall uh, because they really weren't hit that hard. And when they applied, they were open and it just went to paying their employees generally. But for others that were really hit, um, maybe because of the type of business they are and they didn't have, they had a lot of expenses, but not necessarily with employees, they uh, were they some businesses actually 31 that we know of were not able to apply for the funding in the second round mostly because of the bank that they were working with and the issues they had there so that's going to be a targeted group that I think we're going to want to support in if the county does distribute more I, I probably won't say if when the county distributes more funding to local businesses. Um, and then we've had webinars on the for Family First Coronavirus Response Credit and Employee Retention Credit. It's a really complicated, fairly complicated process, especially for micro enterprises. And, and then Shuttered Venue Operators Fund. Uh, we don't, the SBA hasn't put out any information other than uh, 50 entities that have received funding from that and you had to have brick and mortar. So our, our festival and uh, festival operators um, and the like event sponsored businesses have not, uh, were not eligible to receive any funding there. And um, that, here's a recap of what has gone out. There were really quite small amounts uh, for Working Washington one and two, 3,500. Um, and then in three, it was more 12,500 and in working Washington, uh, four there, we, we believe there are about 25 businesses, but department of commerce won't release that information. 
until they've closed it out, but each of those were up $30,000. So we've been working with those businesses that um, have received funding. Um, and let's see, so like Bolt one and two, there were a lot of businesses applied that weren't awarded. Um, and that was also a bulk of funding went to Black Ball and ACTI that were pr hit pretty hard. Um, anyway, I won't go through the rest of those. I'm gonna stop sharing and see. Um, uh, we have some questions in the chat. So I'll let Mark, if you wouldn't mind, sure. some of those questions. Yeah, um, since you're just referencing Black Ball, uh, I'll, I will speak to that briefly. As you noted, um, last time the commissioners made a significant allocation to Black Ball recognizing and ACTI, but Black Ball specifically recognizing the uh, unique and important role that business plays uh, for our county. Uh, and so it, you know, we are sort of uh, thinking about Black Ball separately from the, the rest of the small business support. And we're working closely with our state legislative delegation. Uh, and I do expect uh, that between the, the you know, state and, and local leaders here, we're going to be able to continue to do what we can to support Black Ball. So um, we're, we're looking at that separately from the more general, uh, you know, the more general um, business funding. And I do expect there to be a, some significant support for Black Ball, not, not enough to meet their need, which is, which is tremendous, uh, but hopefully uh, enough to, to be a substantive help. Uh, and uh, there's also a question with regard to grant applications. I'm guessing, uh, Lena, that that, um, that would be around grant applications for uh, business relief. Uh, and so if that's the case, I, I don't exactly have a timeline. I think that the commissioners would like to uh, have, uh, you know, at least some initial allocations prepared within the next month or so, so that we can start getting those dollars flowing. I think it's likely that we will have an initial round of business support, and then uh, probably a second and perhaps uh, additional rounds moving forward. But it it would be at least a, you know, a maybe a month or so before we're sufficiently organized to have that first dollar amount deployed. And then, uh, you know, it will take the EDC team a little bit of time to get organized uh, with regard to process, but uh, hopefully it will be before the end of the summer. So I think that's about as specific as I can be at this point. Thank you, Mark. Um, let's see. So, does anyone else have any questions about maybe how this will roll out or any comments um, as to the process? I think I'm really excited about the process. I think it's a strong one that the commissioners are going to deploy similar to what they did uh, last year, but because there's more time to, uh, create a thoughtful plan, I think they'll be able to bring in some experts in these different, as I called it, buckets of ecosystems to really establish uh, what is relatively the greatest need and then also how can these funds be deployed to provide the greatest impact going forward from a social and economic standpoint. Um, and Colleen, I see that um, Patty Morris has a question about Granges and you know, where where do Granges fit into the big picture? And uh, you know that's a that's a good question. I think that there are a couple of different opportunities to look at at lost revenue. Uh, I think you know for uh, lost revenue for events and things like that. Uh, and so um, I think. Uh, while I have not thought about Granges specifically, I am quite certain that there is some place <laughs> within the realm of uh, relief dollars here that Granges fit in. And uh, once that takes a little bit more shape, Patty, if I don't connect with you uh, about that, then don't hesitate to reach out to me to uh, to ask how 
how we will accommodate for trying to provide some of the support to Fairview and other Granges, which have all been hit due to a lack of ability to do any sort of fundraising, to have uh, pancake breakfasts, uh, you know, to sell scones at the fair and all of the, the normal things that you do. So those, you know, those activities ought to be captured pretty directly in, uh, in a couple of these, these uh, channels of support. Really and, appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, and I, my intention is to work with Angie and uh, Mark Abshire and Lissy and the folks at CIE as an example to, if, if there's a, if we can assess together and I've made a few of those phone calls, like what are you seeing? And, you know, what are you hearing? Things like the, um, uh, the fishing guides out west have been hit really hard. Uh, brand new startup businesses in 2019, say if they started at the end of 2019, they really didn't have comparative information for PPP uh, and, and um, grant programs like that. So we, we know they were left out. And so we're I, I intend to schedule a few meetings, um, just conference calls or, and where we can talk about the different types of businesses that have really not had any opportunity for grant relief and create some programs that are de designed just to help them. And so that's where I could see the Granges coming in um, into, that, into that discussion. But that'll be that design will be created by um, what what we will recommend to the county commissioners as to what types of businesses to target, and then they will approve that, and we'll work with Mark, and we'll then open up applications. We'll have again a um, a committee to review the applications, and then go out to distribution. So hopefully by the end of the summer. So um, anyway, that, that certainly is my intention. And if you can think of types of businesses like uh, Patty brought up uh, that have been left out for one reason or another, um, please let us know. I'm, I'm really disappointed in PPP funding, not going out to a lot of businesses this last year because the amount of funds that we have pales in comparison to what they could have gotten in a PPP round. And it, you know, they went through the whole process of trying to apply for that funding. And then, and you know, we're talking 80, $100,000, not $10,000. And so um, we're, you know, it's a real bummer that that occurred. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that, you know, we can try to fill the gaps as much as possible based on you know, something that occurred that was at no fault of their loan. And when they found out about the problem, it was too late. So the funding had already closed. And Colleen, that's, you know, that's why we're both looking at trying to identify gaps, uh, but also trying to think beyond gaps and what are opportunities for long-term gains. And I think we're going to have the opportunity, at least in some, some instances, to be able to do both of those things. And uh, there, there is no doubt that there was, uh, you know, that, you know, there were, were uh, businesses and organizations that had access to much higher levels of funding for whatever reason. Others, you know, and uh, sometimes through no fault of their own were really challenged to do that. And some just, you know, fell, fell through the cracks. Uh, and so that's why we're really working to, to do both of those things, identify gaps and look at more long-term opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Well, does anybody have anything they want to add? Because if not, we could call it a morning and you can have six minutes back of your life. Okay, well, thank you everyone. And again, if, um, if anybody would like a copy of the slides, they are public information we presented in, to the county commissioners on Monday, um, but I'll be happy to send them to you and I've updated a few of them uh, based on some new information that came out fairly recently. 
Yeah, thank you, Colleen. And I just uh, would really like to acknowledge that the reason why our county has done uh, relatively well with regard to keeping ourselves organized and, uh, and building partnerships so that we can be smart about allocating all these dollars is because of all the hard work that uh, you know, that so many people on this call do to foster and maintain relationships uh, and to really think collaboratively and to prioritize working together. You know, uh, all of you understand that that's not always easy. Uh, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of effort to be collaborative and, uh, and, and uh, you know, because all of you have put the effort into building those relationships, we are very well positioned to act quickly uh, and to act thoughtfully and, uh, and to do a good job with this you know, very unusual uh, bit of, of opportunity that we have here. So I just want to say thank you to all of our partners out there and thank you for the work that you've been doing and uh, thank you for your partnership. Uh, the, the county commissioners certainly depend on it uh, and Colleen and the EC have been truly amazing uh, resources here over the past year and uh, you know we're very we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, such a, a well-developed and well-rounded economic development community uh, and Colleen I just I can't say enough about your leadership uh, here and helping to keep us organized so thanks to everyone on this call and Colleen thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ozias. I really appreciate it. And again, this is a team effort between our chambers and CAE, SBDC, NPBA, you know, you name it. We got a lot of different people working to help businesses and our community and all the different nonprofits that really help uh, our society uh, with folks that have issues. So. Thanks everyone. And um, we'll have this recording up on the website, Choose Qualum First. So if you wanna share it or look back there, it'll be available. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thanks Colleen, bye-bye. Thank you, Commissioner Ozias.